свою честь сегодня представить первого а, ректора, знаменитого профессора Али Декерберг из Гарвардского университета. Ну, на самом деле, конечно, Али Декерберг это одно из тех имен науки, которые в представлении совсем не нуждается. И мы все знаем, что в любом знании есть много ученых, которые долго кропотливо работают, годами, десятилетиями, и все равно их результаты ну, достаточно скромные. А есть другие, которым посчастливливается делать какое-то открытие и более значительно внести вклад а, в свою область. И есть единицы, которые переворачивают все и становятся такими революционерами по своей воле и кого-то получают. И вот после их работ а, их наука никогда не бывает прежней. И вот Арин как раз одна из них. И я бы здесь хотела вспомнить а, цитату другой знаменитой а, ученой дамы, Элиты Левину Дочини, которая получила Нобелевскую премию по медицине, по физиологии, которая говорила, что я не верю, что вообще какая-то наука была бы возможна без интуиции. И вот когда Алис Деперберг заканчивала сначала MIT, потом Гарвард, получила степень по теоретической химии, у нее не было никакой подготовки ни в области когнитивных наук, ни в области наук о поведении животных. Но у нее как раз было огромное количество очень мощной интуиции и веры в себя, и смелости полностью поменять сферу своих исследований, заняться этой темой, которая на тот момент была, считалась полностью делом без ног. И даже ученые считали, что этим вообще невозможно заниматься. Это были коммуникативные способности физиков. И вот прошло 40 лет исследований непрерывных, и благодаря им мы теперь знаем, что эти коммуникативные способности очень мощные, что серые попугаи обладают когнитивным мышлением и могут, в принципе, использовать довольно обширные слова для спонтанной коммуникации с человеком. И испытуемый очень близкий друг Айн, серый знаменитый попугай Алекс, он, наверное, самый знаменитый, самый известный, самый любимый испытуемый из великих лингвистов и среди а, когнитивных ученых и много кого еще. И вот сегодня а, профессор Петер Берг нам расскажет про свои последние эксперименты, в которых проверяют способности серых попугаев к мысленному повторению символических знаков. И я прошу ее приветствовать. Давайте еще раз попробуем. И я сейчас коротко повторю то, что я сказала по-английски, но последний важный, важный комментарий. Арин просит, когда будете фотографировать презентацию в слайде, пожалуйста, не используйте вспышку, это довольно затрудняет лекцию. Пожалуйста, эту просьбу надо учесть. And I'm shifting to English now. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to the first event, to the opening of the third international Neurobiology of Speech and Language Conference, which is organized by the laboratory of behavioral neurodynamics uh, of St. Petersburg University. This is already the third event, and as you know, uh, this year, uh, apart from the more traditional format, we also have three open lectures for both scientific community and general audience, and I'm thrilled to introduce the third lecturer, uh, famous professor Iris Zuckerberg from Harvard University. And she is one of those names in science who doesn't need to be introduced at all. Uh, because as we all know, in any area of knowledge, there are many researchers who keep working for decades, and still their scientific results are more or less modest. There are others uh, who are lucky to make some real discoveries and contribute more significantly to the area. And there are still few of them who are revolutionaries, who make some big things in science, and after them, this area of knowledge is never the same. And Alan Pepperberg is definitely one of them. And now, I would like to uh, quote one of the very uh, impressive things from another famous lady in science, Rita Davi Mantacini, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine, who used to say that, I would not believe there would be any science at all without intuition. And coming back to Iron work, when she graduated first from MIT and then from Harvard uh, with a degree in theoretical chemistry, she had no background in uh, communicative abilities of animals, in animal behavior, in cognitive science, but what she did have was her very powerful intuition and her trust in herself and 
great courage to shift her research to a completely different area that back then still considered a black spot. Even scientists didn't believe that was possible to study at all. And she started, started studying communicative abilities of birds. And now, after almost 40 years of research, uh, we know from the experiment that these amazing creatures, these birds, these great parrots, they can develop things that um, for many years have been considered uniquely human genes, like conceptual thinking and building up a very solid vocabulary for spontaneous communication with humans. And now, today, uh, our owner is the host Irene here at St. Petersburg University, and she will tell us about her recent studies uh, that are dedicated to uh, mental abilities of great parrots, such as mental symbolic rehearsal that are equal to eight-year-old children. So, again, welcome uh, Alan Zetterberg, and please do not take pictures with flash. I pass the microphone to Professor Zetterberg. Enjoy. First, I want to say thank you so much for the honor of being here and for the honor of being the first speaker this time. This is really quite exciting. So, let me start. So my first slide is just the usual thank you slide. And seriously, after 40 years, I cannot list all the people who have helped me in this work. All right, so let me start by a little bit of history. In, 19, in 1983, Kunak wrote a paper arguing that non-humans that understood and could use symbolic representations could solve complex tasks at levels beyond those of subjects lacking such abilities. And this was extremely controversial at the time. Other researchers also around that time were arguing that speech is special, okay, and that animals that didn't have speech obviously could not do any kind of complex communicative task. Now many disagree, but vocal learning does seem to be somewhat important in the evolution of language. And interestingly, only a few non-humans engage in vocal learning and the most common species that do are the songbirds and the parrots. So if we look at the primate lineage, for example, we see that we start with animals, the, like the, the, the small monkeys. They have referential alarm calls, but the calls are not, the calls themselves are not learned. They learn how to use them. The calls are innately specified, and then the animals learn how to use them. <laughs> We have, of course, on the other side, humans that have great complex communication skills. And somewhere in the middle, we have the so-called missing link, where there's the suggestion is that there's something, some kind of vocalization, grunts, and, and sounds that are connected to actions and that establish some kind of communicative system, but we don't know anything about it. What we do know is that there were changes in the brain. Work. So, all right, you can just see it. I'm not here to pull it. Okay. Anyway, you can see that there are changes in the brain from the monkey systems to the human system that have allowed the development of our complex communicative system called language. So, what about other lineages? And what about vo other vocal learners? and possible links between symbolic communication and cognition. And that particular area, what pre-med started, is what I'm fascinated by these days. Um, if you look at the birds, Jarvis, um, in a seminal paper in around the 2005, argues that it's a common ancestor to what's called the language strip in humans, a song strip in songbirds, and a vocalization strip in parrots. And he argues about this because each pathway seems to involve seven structures, and these structures are not connected in exactly the same ways. They function in very similar ways in allowing these animals to do complex communicative skills. So again, if you sort of want to look at a lineage tree, you kind of start with the dinosaurs, and then you have like chickens, where they're again, like the apes, these are, there are referential communicate calls for predators, 
they, the calls themselves are not learned, but their functional use of them is learned. You then have the, what are called the sub -ossines, the birds that do not learn their songs, although they do sing. And what they do is combine these very simple songs, things like Phoebe, Phoebeo, with actions to establish very complex communication skills. So if you understand what you're watching when you see these birds, they will make certain sounds and certain actions, and you know they're going to attack another bird. Or they'll do certain other things, and you know they're just going to sit quietly on the perch. You then go to the songbirds, where there are complex, learned, multiple songs, various different songs are used in different contexts for native attraction versus territorial defense. And the parrots, which also have very complex communication skills, we spent you know, weeks and weeks on several field seasons trying to understand them. All that we could find out was that there are certain vocalizations that are aggressive, certain are affiliative, and many, many different vocalizations within all those different categories. We also propose that there's some kind of missing link also in the avian system. So essentially, you can draw parallels between the monkey system and that of, say, the chickens, between the apes and the sub songbirds, between the missing link in humans and what's purportedly a possible missing link in the songbird system. There's a bird called the bellbird, which is ostensibly a sub but it has vocal dialects, and you only see dialects in birds that learn their song. So this is a, an aspect of the bird song literature that people are still very interested in and trying to explore to whether this bird could be a potential missing link. And then, of course, you've got, on the other end, I'm not going to try to say that our parents are like adult humans, but they are very much like young children in that they have a certain amount of, of speech, they use it referentially, they use it meaningfully, they communicate extensively with those vocalizations. So again, you might argue that many species begin with a truly basic learning and imitation center that's responsible. It's responsible for things like neonate imitation. It's not under any conscious control. And that it develops eventually, okay, both when you look at over evolutionary time and within humans, for example, and within some of these birds, okay, or developmentally over age, into the system that is responsible for referential communication, if not full language. This system can encode the relationship between another agent's action, the context of the action, and the ability to replicate the action. In humans, this eventually develops into the full-blown language-related brain, okay? And for which some bird brains demonstrate by striking parallels. Now today, I'm not going to talk too much about those parallels, but I want to focus on how vocal learning enables symbolic representation and thereby enables additional cognitive advances. I want to examine briefly why parents can use symbolic representation and learn advanced cognitive concepts. And the majority of my talk will be discussing two experiments for which we believe symbolic representation was critical for their success. So again, a little bit of history. When I began this work in the 1970s, basically the term avian cognition was an oxymoron. People felt that birds were I mean, totally incapable of any kind of complex cognitive processing, incapable of anything but the most simplest of noise sounds. Um, any research that was being done on these topics were being done with the great apes that had a close phylogenetic relationship to humans, or dolphins that have a large brain. And so when I proposed in my very first grant, grant proposal to study communicative and cognitive abilities of African great parrots, the reviewers very liberally asked me what I was smoking. <laughs> and of course, this was the 70s. Um, and again, they, they had good reason to, to say these kinds of things. Birds, parrots were known as simple mimetic birds. They could just probably want a cracker. There was no understanding that these vocalizations could have any meaning. And very little was known about avian brains. Okay? Over the last two decades, however, 
There's an amazing amount of data from Asian neurobiologists that have provided the rationale for the data that I will be presenting. But when I gave my first talks, people literally got up and said, well, this can't be true. There's no cortex. And I would say, well, these are my data. Go find it. And eventually they did. So the issue is that you've got this, this small blob of protoplasm. OK, and you look at the relative size between the avian brain and the human brain. There are no sulci. There are no gyri. OK, it's just a small, tiny little blob. And yet it does the kinds of things that our brain does. And how does that happen? Well, it turns out that not only do they have areas functionally equivalent to the primate <coughs> cortex, but these cortices are larger than or comparable to primates of the same body mass size, and they have an average twice as many neurons as primates of comparable size. So these brains are densely, densely packed. All right? And there's all these references. If you want them, you can email me later or talk to me later about them. These brains also have a unique shell, and particularly in parrots, that are likely responsible for the ability to reproduce heterospecific vocalizations. And tentatively, it's proposed that these are responsible for the cognitive capacities of these birds. And like mammals, their brainstem nuclei connecting telencephalon and cerebellum also purportedly associated with the evolution of complex cognitive abilities. So whatever that little blob of protoplasm is doing, it's doing what our brain is doing. And over the course of the 40 years plus that I've been working with these birds, okay, Alex, my most famous subject, he learned labels for about 150 different objects, colors, shapes, he learned seven colors, uh, five shapes, labels for categories. So he not only knew the labels, you know, rose, green, blue, purple, whatever, but he understood that they were subsumed under a category called color. And the same is true for shape. He understood two, three, four, five, six, seven corners went under shape. He understood that paper and cork and wood and wool went under the category of matter. Okay? So he had concepts of categories. You could show him any two objects and ask him what was same or what was different. And he would tell you the label of the category. Okay? If there was nothing same or everything was same, he would say, and you ask him these questions, he said none. So he had a concept of absence. He understood relative size. So you could show him any two objects and say, what color bigger, what color smaller, what matter bigger, what matter smaller. When we showed him for the first time two objects of the same size and asked him what color bigger, he transferred his understanding of same and different of none from same and different to none for the category of size. And he told us that they were none bigger or none smaller. He understood number concepts. I could give an hour long lecture on a number concept. Basically, he understands concepts, number concepts, at the level of about four or five year old children and at levels that have not yet been shown in the world. He learned most of his abilities through a modeling technique that was developed by Yves Martot and heavily depended on joint attention. So just like young children, when we're working with the bird, we jointly attend with the bird on a particular object and we talk about the colors and the shapes and the other qualities about it. If we have our backs to the bird and we're talking like this, just like you couldn't hear me, they wouldn't understand that what I was talking about was related to what they were playing with. So we have to jointly attend to these things, just like young children. Alex understood recursion, not at the level of humans, where we talk about, this is the cat that bit the rat that ate the cheese, and they all lived in the house that Jack built. So everything recursively responds to Jack the, the house. But that, along with conjunction, in terms of you could give him a big tray of different objects, and say, what object is green and three corners? Or what, uh, what, what color is three corners and wood? So we have to recursively go back to the original attributes. He, had, he could transfer, as I mentioned, he transferred the concept of absence to different types of uh, types of subjects. His vocalizations were intentional. He had phrases like, I want X and want to go Y. 
for X and Y were appropriate object or location labels. If he asked for a banana and you gave him a grape, he would literally take the grape and throw it at you and go, want banana, and make it very clear as to what he wanted. He had fast mapping of the sort in that he would make up vocalizations and then if we could map something onto them, they would become embedded in his repertoire. So he learned the color gray by seeing himself in a mirror and asking what color. We told him it was gray and he started to use it appropriately. He then used, played around with it and came up with grape, brain, chain, cane, things like that, so that we could give him the objects and they, did, they became completely embedded in his repertoire. He made up a couple of labels, so he came up with binary, combining banana cherry for an apple, on the assumption that it was, you know, tasted a little bit like a banana and looked like a big cherry. He came up with banacker, but he didn't like the dried banana chips that we gave him, so he didn't keep saying banacker. So he had to like what it was that we gave him. But this was a way of increasing his repertoire. And here's his little bit of vocalization, so you can hear him. What corn? What corn? What wheat? What wheat? Little bits of, of cereal. What color? Orange. Okay, so you get a feeling for his vocalizations. Okay, so recently we've been focusing on perception and cognition using symbolic representation. Work on number concepts, optical illusions, which he sees as we do, visual memory, liquid conservation, Piagetian studies on liquid conservation, and probabilistic reasoning. And I'm going to spend today talking about the visual memory and the probabilistic reasoning, because I think those are the most fun topics that we've been working on recently. So visual search. This was done with the assistance of a postdoc in the Vision Lab, Greg Kalian. And this is an interesting topic because for humans, visual working memory allows us to build mental models of the world and simulate alternative realities, providing means for flexible adaptive behaviors. I mean, basically, we can stand at a crossroads and think about different possible ways that we could choose to do things and the effects that it would have on our lives. Okay, and visual working memory has been extensively studied, both in human and non-human objects. There's nothing special about that. However, there's something called visual working memory manipulation, and that is not at all well understood. And that involves basically thinking about where things are and then remembering where they are after we've manipulated them. So what are the limits on how we can operate on that stored information that we have to solve a lot of different problems in our world? What are the evolutionary bases for that behavior? And is it you know, a signature of human cognition? Or is it widespread among non-humans? Now, keeping track of things in the world is crucial for survival. Predators and prey both must know where they are. And this changes at a moment's notice. So that lion pack, is really you know, checking out where those wildebeests are. And everything, if you've ever been watching that in Africa, it's, it's lightning, how things change at a moment's notice. And the animals that you thought were going to survive don't, and the ones that you thought were not going to make it somehow do. Think of birds eating their fleshlings. Okay? They've got a bunch of fleshlings. They're bent, literally bouncing around on the perches. They're moving around. Mom and Dad have to remember who got fed and who didn't get fed. And this is critical for survival. OK, so this behavior is not the same as the classic shell game. So the classic shell game, you have a little red block, you cover it, and then you do some movements. And then I ask you to find the red block. And it's not easy, but most, many of you can find it. OK, now imagine tracking many things simultaneously. All right, so we've covered three different things. And now I'm moving all these things around. Now, where's the yellow block? That's a lot harder. All right? So we gave variations of this task to adults, to children, and to the great parrot griffin. And there were several stages. So we started with two cups with no swaps. 
Then with one, two, three, and four swaps. Then we went to three cups with all those swaps. Then to four cups with all those swaps. Okay? And the point about this work is that Griffin had no special training. We had him watch us do three of these trials so he would understand the basis for the behavior. He already understood match to sample. That sort of came out with all the labeling work. He had the exact same number of trials as did the humans and the children, and in the same order. And he got a cashew as a reward. The children got little stickers. So I'm going to show you, this is from the front, and this is from aerial view. And I'm going to show you all these different permutations. Now watch what's going on here. I'm covering them. What he taps is what is correct. So he can look around, but it's the one he taps. And he got it right. I don't know if any of you could have done that. I certainly couldn't. <laughs> so for set size two, here's his data compared to adults and to children. He's really, really good. For set size three, he had one little blip there. I think he was not paying attention on one of the trials. But essentially, he is so much better even up to four switches than the adults and the children. For set size four, he starts out much, much better. Then he sort of loses it a little bit. But he still is basically at the level of the children. And we, we couldn't do set size four and four swamps with the children. They just would not sit still for it, literally sit still for this. So we don't know what their data would have been. So for 0, 1, 2 swaps, he's equal to or outperforms the children and the adults for all set sizes. For 3 and 4 swaps, he outperforms human and children for all sizes except for 4, where his data suggests he's initially better than adults, but for 3 and 4 swaps, he's at least as good as 8-year-old children. For set size 5, he's at 100%, and adults, humans, cannot do 100% for set size 5. So statistical analyses show that this ability increases across lifespan in humans, and Griffin was 23 when we were doing this, so he had a bit of an advantage over the children in some respect, but still, he was, he's still a parent. And we don't know if this depends on a shared resource, such that the storage ability must reach its full level before manipulation ability can proceed further. We think that is the case. Children are quite good at the storage at, at the young ages. It's that manipulation that starts. Their manipulation is just basically moved down along with their storage. So if their storage goes down a little bit, the manipulation goes down and the curves match. In any case, he's really, really good at this. Much better than children by a huge margin in small sets. And fails to match adult humans on only the most difficult tasks. It might have to be with the stability of its representations and some kind of interference, possibly an important difference with adult humans. But what was really, really interesting was respect to the most difficult transitions, okay, my Harvard students who were videotaping also failed on a lot of these tasks, all right? <laughs> and the students who did succeed, and this is the critical point for the talk, the students who did succeed say they used color labels and mentally rehearsed positions in an N-1 strategy. So for the four swaps and the four objects, they would think red, green, blue, yellow. Red, yellow, green, blue. And they would rehearse that. And the idea is that you have to have vocal labels to do that. Well, Griffin knows his vocal labels. Maybe that's what he was doing. And maybe that's how he could do this task. And so we're planning to test this in Tenerife now with non-labeling grades. We have access to 12 grade parents and in the Laurel Park. And I've also um, convinced my friends at Vienna, University of Vienna, to look at this with Cash and Corvus. Because one of our thoughts is that the Cash and Corvus would be really, really good at this, even better than the parents. Because they have to remember where their caches are. And they also move their caches from time to time. You have to re-update 
this is of it. So we will see to be continued. We have also done another set of experiments with, with Griffin to figure out what is going on in those four swamps, and we're crunching the data as I speak. But again, the take-home ability, the take-home and take-home message to this, excuse me, is that his abilities are far beyond what we would have expected. So this a second study is on probability, and this was done with uh, my students. Uh, Catherine Clements proposed this project as a it was a paper in my class what that she did. The final in my classes are always design an experiment. And she designed this experiment. It was so good that I asked her to work in the lab and, and do it with us. And so that's where this came from. So this is probability. It's basic, basic DMJ and probabilistic studies. And it involves the ability to make generalizations about a sample based on information about a population. Okay, that's a scientific gobbledygook in regular English. So I give you three red beads and one blue bead. That's the population. What is the likelihood if I throw them in a box and mix it up and pull one out that you'll have a blue bead in the mix? All right, that's a classic Indian task. However, people have looked at a variations on this task and they claim that children as young as seven months old can do this. Piaget found that his children could not do this until they were about seven years old. So the issue is, what is going on here? And my argument is that the different task types test different types of ability. So the task given to the human entrance may have more to do with habituation than with inductive understanding. And I'll give you a few examples. So in one task, the experimenter has a big box. You see it on the top there. And they slowly remove one ball at a time from each box and put it in a little box. And they fill up the little box. And then they open the big box. And some of them, OK, have a mixture that doesn't match the mixture in the small box. And the children look more when there is a mismatch. So it would seem that the infants are tracking probability, but maybe not. Sometimes just the in, they look longer because there's a perceptual mismatch. It's just more interesting. It doesn't require them to understand anything about the ratio or the relationship between the sample and the population. So other researchers did another study where they show a kind of a little balloon thing with objects bouncing around over time. And then a curtain falls down. And then one of two objects falls out, either the blue thing or the red thing. And the children looked longer when it was a minority item. And people claimed, aha, again, probability. But it could just be novelty. I mean, it's not that they understand it. They're just responding to something that could be more of interest. Again, the older children see the classic probability. Three things of one type are put in the box, one of another, the can has been shaken, one block is removed while hidden in the hand. Oops, sorry. Okay. Oh. That really flapped up. Okay. And then the child is asked to label the color of the hidden block. Before age six, I mean, six-year-old children, okay, you get answers sketchy, like red because it's my favorite color. Or, well, you put one red one in and you took one thing out, so it has to be red. There's logic there, but it's not exactly the right logic. You can see that the, the brains, they're, they're trying to come up with something, but they don't quite get it. Only later, okay, and this is we're talking about children between six to seven years old, well, they'll come up with something and say, well, blue, because it's the most But it takes a long time. Now, many of these studies use additional controls to ensure that the alternative explanations that I've given were ruled out, but it's still kind of weird that the young children seem to succeed while the older children fail. And what I'm arguing is that the task given infants rely on po post hoc observations. Something is weird. They don't necessarily know what. They just know something is weird. The older children are what we call pre-hulk. 
It's expectancies, it's reasoning. They have to encode their responses vocally and understand that although proportions control this likelihood, it doesn't guarantee a particular result. I mean, sometimes when I put my hands in that bucket, I really am going to bring up the red ball. It does happen. Okay, not very often, but it can happen. So prior to our study, the only non-humans that had been, been tested in this had been the great apes and capuchin monkeys. And they were given very simple types of tasks, similar to giving young children, very young children, in what they call a crawling to a preferred set procedure. All right, so what you do is you take two buckets and you have them filled with, you know, either more pink candies or more black candies. And you figure out beforehand the, whether the children like the pink or the black more. And you work on that basis. And basically you let them crawl to the bucket that they want you to take a candy out of and give it to them. All right? For the apes, they gave them buckets of bananas and carrots. And they very much preferred the banana pieces. So you can see all those different ratios that the, the apes were given. But unlike the children and eventually our bird, the buckets were always in view. So the apes didn't have to remember something about the representations. So it was much easier. And each set of trials for the apes had a different type of control. So they may have responded with a different type of strategy. So if you look at all those buckets, you can see. You can simply avoid a bucket with a few favorite candies or bananas. You could avoid a bucket that's tainted with the disfavored issues. And this goes back to something called suboptimal choice, which is really quite odd. But it has to do with the fact that if I give you a choice between, say, you know, one piece of cheese and a piece of cheese plus a carrot, you might just choose the cheese by itself if you really hate carrot, because somehow the carrot makes the cheese less good. And there are actual studies on this with humans. Um, you know, and none of the trials for the apes had all of the controls in place. So again, to try to explain this in terms of real life situations, okay, the difference between these early and later childhood tasks can be, you know, I can give you an example. Imagine a sparrow with two songs, its favorite song, which it sings the majority of the time, and a less favorite one that it sings only once in a while. Maybe it's harder to produce, we don't know. But we know if we take the spurs, we'll hear it sing the songs in a different proportion. So the early childhood cho choice is like having to choose between two patches and deciding based on the variance of the patch and which one would it be easier for him to defend his territory. Well, obviously the one that has his majority song because you know he can do much better at it, all right? The task giving the old children compares to his being in a patch with three singers of his majority and one of his minority and testing how many times he chooses to sing each song to best defend his space. So he has to make choices based on what he knows is going on in the system. So given all these differences, and all the different results and all these problems, we decided to use a standard Piagetian task because we had a great parrot who could talk, who could actually tell us you know, what was in our hand when we pulled it out of the bucket. And we decided to use one of the more difficult proportions for the children, that one to three proportion. Now, the other difference that you know, becomes problematic for us was that when people do the childhood studies, they have 100 children, and you give each child one to two trials, and that's fine, and they're happy. We had a par one parent. We had to give them 96 trials for statistical significance. We had to give them only one or two trials per day. We had to separate the trials by days, because he'd see the bucket, and he'd look at us and go, want to go back. Because he didn't, could never be 100% correct, he could only guess, and he hates, Griffin hates guessing. So it took us a very long time to get these 96 trials. All right. And to keep him interested in the task, and to avoid having him use answers based on mass or contour, we used lots of different sets of items. So we couldn't just say, oh, it's always going to be, you know, there's going to be three corks and one key, and it's always going to be corks. 
We used mixtures of wood and wool and paper and keys and cords, and we switched minority-majority reversals. So in some trials, it could be more cords than keys, and on some, more keys than cords. And we lined the box so we, we couldn't hear the clunk of anything going in. And we timed our removals so that we pulled out the majority and minority after the same number of seconds so we couldn't think, oh, you know, she's searching around for the minority and that must be it. And basically, he couldn't know what removed, okay? He had to guess. So for us, the question was, would he just guess randomly, thinking this is crazy, I'm just gonna be totally random. Would he guess just more is more likely and always so 100% minority, majority, or would he choose based on the ratio of what he saw put in, 75-25? And we did indeed pull the minority out to 25% of the time using random.org to make sure that it was totally random. And he tracked the probability exactly. And I had the students recalculate because I, I you know, this is too good. I mean, it was exactly 73 to 23. And the type of object didn't matter. He monitored the proportions over time, whatever they were doing. And importantly, what the, what the critical issue here is not how many times he is correct, because he can't be correct. He can't know what's there, okay? He was only correct about 60% of the time. What's critical is that how he was dealing with this uncertainty. All right, what was his doing when given this uncertainty? We had to test for primacy versus recency effects. So the idea was if he saw us put in, you know, one thing first, did he focus on that and just keep talking about that? Or did he focus on the most recent thing we dumped in and focus on that? And he didn't. He saw this very slight recency effect, but it wasn't statistically significant. We also had to test if he had the sort of a gambler's facility and basing the results on the pre prior trial. Now, granted, prior trial meant like one trial per day more, you know, sometimes it was the first or the second trial, but still, was that important? And the answer was no, okay? Because we could do it based on first versus second trials and it didn't matter what the prior trial was. We did pull out the minority 25% of the time. We did the cure in any which way, and no, it didn't matter, all right? So he was tracking the probability of the set. Now, in reality, okay, that is not optimal. I mean, if you really understand probability, what you should do is always guess the majority item, okay, because that is the, really the thing most likely to come out. But that's how Vegas and other gambling roulette places do so well, because people don't do that. They track the probability. They know that it can't always be the majority, so they try to guess when the minority is going to come up. You can't. It's random. But if you look at people at various gambling type situations, that's exactly what humans do. And that's exactly what Griffin was doing. Okay? So we can't say that he understood probability at the level of, of you and me. He did succeed at the level of these seven-year-old children. And of course, his use of referential labeling was crucial for testing. He could not have done this if he couldn't label the objects. So again, I believe that there is something that really makes him special. And we have several other different types of topics where it really seems that his ability to label and Alex's ability to label gives them an edge. In terms of number concepts, Alex's ability to label exact sets allowed him to do number concepts at levels that you couldn't only see in the few apes that also had symbolic representation. Now the interesting thing, I mean, parrots and primates, you know, it, 300 million years since the evolutionary split. So it's very, we've got this convergent evolution and it's quite likely that these concepts are quite you know, widespread across species. If you look at the way parrots are in the wild, and this is a picture of great parrots in Cameroon in 1997, and I have to say that
that because if you went back to our study site now, you might see three parents. They have hit sightings, one endangered species. And I've talked to people who have been looking at elephants in our study site. And they're so excited because they saw five parrots. And this is what we saw in 1997. But the point of this slide is not to yell at you about conservation. It's to say that these parrots live in the same environment as the great apes. We suggest that the same evolutionary pressures that were exerted to get the intelligence of the great apes came, were exerted on the parrot precursors as well. They are what are known in, in the, term, in the um, ecological literature as K-selected, meaning they are long-lived, they have very few offspring at a time, they invest heavily in those offspring, okay? They basically have a complex ecological system. They, they like the primates, they forage 60 kilometers a day so that they have to keep a memory of this huge area where there are the trees that are fruiting. Which tree did they eat all the ripe fruit from today so they shouldn't go back for another week or so? Which tree over their long lifetime has died? Where are their new trees coming up in those areas, all right? In terms of the social system, they're in a pigeon-fusion collection. They go off in small groups of about five or six birds to forage at a time. We don't know if they're family groups. And then they collect the savannah in groups of about 100 or so. They'll then break off again. And at night, they used to be groups of like 700 birds at a time. So they're constantly learning about different relationships. And to be able to survive in this situation, given that they're dominant hierarchies, they have to understand things like transitive inference. If Sam beat up on Joe and Joe beat up on me, I don't go near Sam. Okay, I infer that Sam is a much stronger bird just from my interactions with Joe and knowing Joe's interactions with Sam. And you multiply this over the course of the flock. So they have all this incredible complex information that they have to deal with on a daily basis to survive. And we think that's why when we take them into the laboratory and we test them, they do so very well. So again, I'm sort of summarizing that there's this advanced avian cognition. He's got the, he's got the cognitive abilities of about a seven year old, maybe eight, sometimes six, depending on the task. Their communicative abilities are much more like about a one and a half or two year old, but they use the symbolic representation and they encode their responses vocally. And they can't have a, a communication the way you and I do at that level but they communicate with us about the situations in which we are testing them. And they're doing it at that level, they're doing it with very advanced abilities. So we continue to work on a number of different cognitive tasks to determine the limits of their abilities. And again, the take home messages, they have this use of symbolic representation, a possible language precursor. And I really do think that allows them to work with us at these levels that you would not see with animals that didn't have these abilities. So I want to thank you very much for listening. And I think we can do some questions. Yes, people will transmit for me. And again, thank you so very much. Thank you very much for the fascinating talk. And yes, we do have some time for questions. У нас есть время на некоторое количество вопросов. У нас есть два микрофона в конце зала. Один здесь, он будет лайен. Пожалуйста, можно поднимать руки, и мы будем координировать. Окей. 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 Uh, 
publisher or something. So uh, did he actually interact with people or maybe a uh, computer? No. Yeah. no, he interacts with people. He, it, he starts conversations for Alex more so than Griffin, but he will ask you, for Alex in particular, if you brought in something new, he'd ask you the color, he'd ask you the shape, he'd say, what's that? Griffin, not so much, but Alex, definitely. So they would initiate communication. And if he wanted to learn the label, he would keep asking so he could hear you say it. So we get to this thing, what color? And I say, brown. He said, what color? Brown. And then he would start trying to say it. Uh, so how basically uh, these process are initialized? Uh, so this label process. Uh, I, I, because I don't think it's just from uh, he, he's born, when he's born. And stuff. So we need to actually to teach, teach him how to label him. Yeah. Oh, how do we teach? Yeah. We mostly use the modeling system. I didn't have time to go into it, but I'm happy you asked. So we would have the parrot on a perch. We had an object that it really wanted. This is how we started. And I had a student sitting next to me. So this is make believe, this is the bird, this is a student and me, and I have the object. And I show it to the student, I say, what's this? And if she answers correctly, she gets the object and she gets to play with it. And he's looking very excited because he wants the object. Then we exchange the role. So she's the model for his behavior and his rival for my attention because we're not looking at him, we're just working. Then she asks me, and the first time I'll, I'll answer correctly and I'll play with it, but every once in a while we'll make a mistake. So he sees that not every weird sound, you know, same will cause this transfer. So for example, she says it to me, I go key, and I get it, and I play with it. The next time I go work, and she goes, no, you're wrong. <laughs> so that work isn't gonna work, but key works. They can't produce the sound immediately. They have to learn how to control the muscles in their syrinx, and the trachea somewhat, the larynx, the glottis, just like you and me, the tongue going in and back and up and down, opening and closing the beak. But they will come out initially with something like E, okay, for the key, and then we, over time we will shape it by saying things like, that's close, say better, and we'll model E, and then key, and that's how they learn it. And after a while, it turns out that they, they sometimes we want them to learn labels for things that they don't particularly are interested in. So we taught them to request. That's when the want came in. So they can, you know, so if you tell me the color of this thing, you can ask for something else you want. And they learn that interaction. But so actually that does perfect because that's why you actually try to talk in this kind of uh, uh, middle uh, label from the banana and uh, you, you talk about uh, uh, the apple, the, the cherry, the, the yes. Kind of yeah. And how much does it take to actually learn a new label? Because it seems uh, it looks like a, maybe a month of a intense. It month. depends on the, the label. So some sounds like pun for paper with no lips, very long time. Like key, it's quick because the <coughs> sound is in here and it's easy. Look, also. But no lips, very hard. So some things are easy, some things are hard. If he already has the sound, so once he learned the put in paper, okay, he could go to parrot and learn the word parrot, things like that. Or he learned carrot overnight because he had the put from key and the rest of them from parrot. Okay, thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, uh, what is the average amount of words that gray parrot is capable of learning? I'm sorry, what's the. What is the average uh, oh, amount number? of words? Number yeah. of words, yes, that gray parrot is um, capable of learning. Okay, it depends on what you mean by learning. So, my birds learn about 100, 150 words. Um, if they are just producing the sounds, there are records of 600 or 700. Uh, no, I meant but, the, uh, but we work, we work, and 
I also have to say that I, there's a limit because I am less interested in increasing the vocabulary than in the concepts. So we only train labels for what we need for our research. And sometimes they'll pick up labels like for food on their own. But we don't, we don't just train labels for the sake of labels. So they may be able to learn more. Our words just seem to be limited to about that because that's what we're interested in. OK, and then the second question. Uh, you said that you're going to try uh, the same experiments with other parrots. And uh, what are the other species of parrots that are potentially capable of uh, the the same? Okay. Uh, well, we, we have access, um, in terms of the cognitive abilities, we have access to a macaw and two species of Amazons, as well as the greys in Tenerife. So we can look at those in terms of the cognitive abilities. In terms of vocal learning, I think we would have to adapt our training techniques a little bit to the other birds, because they, they're in terms of attention span and things like that. So that's a separate topic, and we haven't yet tried that. And that's something that is really limited in our access and our to these birds and the amount of time we would have to do. It's also important, we've learned, that the birds need to be kept separate from one another when they're first learning their labels. Because if they're together with one another, our youngest bird, Athena, she's always with Griffin. And she really thinks that she just needs to talk parrot because they spend a lot of time whistling and chatting with one another in parrot. Alex was an only bird for 15 years. So he learned that if he wanted to communicate with any other creature, it had to be in English. And this turned out to be very important because people have tried to replicate our work. Having birds in an aviary, it doesn't work. The birds have to really be separated out so that they're forced to learn to communicate with us. Okay, uh, thank you very much. For your attention, uh, we can kindly, um, if you don't mind, how many birds do we have in the, in the last ex experiment? Was it just Griffin or was it? Uh, yes, it was just Griffin. Because at that point, Alex had passed away many years ago. Athena had only learned a few labels at this stage, so we couldn't use her. Thank you. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот вы сказали, что один попугай и смышленный другого, ну, в переводе как бы, а зависит ли это смышленность и вообще способности от возраста попугая? И с какого, с какого возраста вот попугаи могут демонстрировать такие, осваивать эти способности и демонстрировать? Спасибо. Спасибо. Вы сказали, что один попугай смышленный другого. У меня вопрос. Вот это смышленый. Да может и так я перевели.
Еще раз, да? Да, спасибо большое. Вот, вы сказали, что один попугай с ручьем из другого. И вопрос, вот, собственно, это смышленно эти сами способности осваивать, осваивать воспроизводительные действия. Это весь этот возраст. Из какого возраста попугаи могут это делать? Okay, so they start, I mean, they start learning to talk very, very young, about, um, Griffin started at about 13 or 14 weeks, making some sounds. Uh, Alex, I didn't get until he was a year old. Um, and the, the problem with Griffin is that Alex dominated him. So that when we were trying to train Griffin, Alex, I'd say, Griffin, what color? And Alex would sit on the next cage and say, no, tell me what shape. <laughs> so Griffin would look at me, look at Alex and go. <laughs> so he became, he became the student Who's the student, just tell me what I have to do to get the A. He didn't want to try hard to try to solve problems. Just, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it absolutely perfectly. And you can see, when we give him a task, he does it extremely well. But he doesn't like to solve the problems. So I don't think it's that he's less smart. In some ways, I think he's smarter. But he's a different type of smart. And Athena has no, we, we joke, the term is no off switch. She's quite hyperactive, and her attention span is very short compared to Alex and to Griffin. So it's very, it's hard, it's a challenge to work with her. So there are personality differences, but she's extremely smart and manipulative in getting what she wants. And there are anecdotes I could tell you that it's very clear she's extremely smart. She just doesn't want to be smart in the way that I would like her to be smart so I can test her scientifically. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, illuminating topic. Just a couple of uh, short questions. The first one is that uh, if there is any evidence about the capability of uh, parrots to build uh, and use tools, uh, as it happens with crowds, for example. And the second question is that uh, if we imagine that a couple of these uh, parrots learn uh, the same set of symbolic associations, would you guess that they would use this kind of uh, culture between them without the human beings? Um, Greys do not seem to use much tools. Cockatoos do. So if you're interested in, in tool use and parrots, look at the work by Alice Ausberg. It's beautiful work on tool use. Greys tend to not use tools very much. I'm not sure why, but they really don't. Um, in terms of talking to one another, we do have this, this little bit of evidence with Alex and Griffin where Alex would be questioning Griffin. And just before Alex died, we actually got him to work as one of the models in the system. So he would take turns with us asking me questions and asking Griffin questions. So I think down the road, that's a possibility. Okay, um, you know, I don't, I don't know with, with Athena what's happening because she's just a little bit different. But, um, but I think they, they will use, they, they, to, to a small extent, they will use these vocalizations with one another. Probably not at the level, it's easier to use parrot. Um, thank you for your lecture, and I would like to ask you, um, do you plan to uh, learn uh, Griffin uh, some um, not materi material, um, understanding material objects like color and shape, but uh, learn uh, to understand uh, some abstract notions like uh, confusing or liking something. And uh, one day he said, oh, I'm confused. I don't <laughs> know <laughs> what the shape or what the color. That, that's a very good question because People are actually trying to look at that with non-vocal tasks with a lot of different subjects. And 
The problem is trying to figure out how to train something like that, all right, without getting a, particularly a bird, some of the birds to sort of just use the term when they don't want to work. So for example, right now, when Griffin doesn't want to work, or say, want to go back, or he'll turn around and start preening, rather than, than using something like that. Um, on a related, I can answer a related question, though, in terms of people ask me, why don't you give them terms for emotions? And I say that it's very hard to understand and a human, what another human is experiencing in an emotion. Sometimes even it's hard for us to understand our own emotions. So that trying to figure out, well, is he confused? Is he angry? Is he tired? Or something like that. It's very hard to train a label in that sense. So we've avoided that just because it's so difficult in this stage. Thank you. Um, my question is about um, comparison, uh, apes and parrots. Have you ever compared them on the same task? And I heard that you uh, compared parrots with humans and uh, apes with humans. And have you ever had tests between um, parrots and apes? Okay, so one of the, I, I can't work with apes myself. <laughs> is rely on my colleagues who have published other papers or are willing to work with me. So what we try to do is to go into the literature and do those kinds of comparisons. So we've just done a study on Piagetian liquid over-conservation. And it turns out, as we were going through the age study, we found some confounds with their tasks. So we didn't want to replicate those tasks. So we did what we think are more interesting tasks. But on the tasks that we did, some of the tasks we could replicate exactly. And the parrots did at least as well on the task. And on one of the tasks, they did better. So I think one of the problems with work with the apes studies is that the apes are, they're, they're, they're like Athena. Their attention spans are kind of short and getting them to really focus is hard. And I think that on some of the tasks, if they could get them to calm down and focus better, they would respond better. But they're so impulsive on some of these tasks. We did a task, it's called the ephemeral choice task. And if you think about this, okay, you have two plates. One is black and one is white. And each of them have a treat on them. If you choose the black plate, I will also let you eat what's off the white plate. But if you choose the white plate, you can only eat what's on the white plate. So how long does it take to learn which plate to choose? Well, it turns out that rats fish that actually have something like this in the wild, it takes them about 30 trials. It took our parents less than 30 trials. Apes could not do this on over 100 trials. Capuchin monkeys were about 50 or 70 trials, somewhere in there. And it was the impulsive, uh, impulsivity of the apes. And they did also, they finally figured out a task related to this where they could separate the impulsivity and then the apes could do it. But they couldn't do the exact task because of the impulsivity. We also did a delayed gratification study, and Griffin waited for 15 minutes for a better reward, which is quite a bit longer to get the apes because of this impulsivity issue. Thank you very much. My question is somehow related to this one, because I was wondering why you compare birds with humans and apes with humans. Is it possible to measure cognitive Possibilities, cognitive abilities in somehow independent tool without comparative with human children? Okay, that's a good question. I mean, I guess I have to say that it's very easy to take these tasks that were used, that have standards, that people agree test intelligence. And 
And so it's much easier to take one of those tasks and adapt them for the merge than to try to come up with a separate task. Because then if you come up with this and the bird succeeds, people can argue that it's not a you know, well-respected task. It's not an accepted task. So, I mean, it would be fun. But I think it would be harder to get it accepted in the literature as a valid task. And people might argue that it's something just very specific to a parrot, for example. And that, you know, another animal couldn't do it because they're not a parrot. So it's, it's a kind of, a, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting question. And it's not a matter of laziness, but it's a matter of saying, okay, people accept this as a tool for testing intelligence. So let's just see how we can, can adapt this for the parrot. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I want to ask you a question from my mind. He studied the experience of poverty, the future of the experience of that, some of my relatives too, and they said that if, when we train the children, they also train you. And I had a friend who was a dog mom, and they said that when they train dog, the dog trains you too. And the same with the horse. So what, um, if you just train you, for example, your own <laughs> test on this thing, I bet it's now than 20 years ago. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear it. When you get the somebody, when you slap it, for example, the children, go, what do you do? You not only train him, but when you study the children, for example, if I was to study with you, somebody, yes? You would also train me for something, yes? And then, especially if you get the dog, they say they not only they train dog, but the dog train them, train, they teach you, yes? So what uh, if you just train you, for example, your own personal test, I bet it would be on this. But you just study your people to love the country. I really apologize. I'm just not following the question. Um, So how do the parents train us? It's a very, it is a very interactive process. And what we've learned that there are certain types of tasks that the birds are very eager to do. And we therefore tend to focus on those types of tasks, so they've sort of trained us. So for example, the, the PNJ in liquid conservation and over conservation, they love drinking juice. So it's very, you know, so they sort of trained us that we should do those types of tasks because they like to do them. And with the probability, we're trying to do the next stage in probability, a different proportion. And every time Griffin sees that bucket come out, We've even changed the color of the bucket. But he sees that bucket, and he goes, well, I want to go back. And he just doesn't want to work because it's such a frustrating task. So they, in a lot of ways, they've trained us on the types of tasks that they want to do versus you know, anything else. It's, it's a very, it, it, it is, it's subtle, but it's there, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about work again. Uh, this successive learning uh, clashes with the band from, uh, I think, I'm sorry, ability of parrots or from uh, means of words. Is a banana better than carrots? Uh, if banana has beans, uh, and uh, banana is a better food. <laughs> Is uh, as good as our abilities or uh, means of words? What portion uh, uh, for your, uh, banana has beans? 
and uh, for bananas it's a not good oil, yeah. right? Uh, but uh, banana is better than carrots because uh, carrots like banana. Right. Okay, so it's not just for it. So is it easier? But it's only onions. So is it, what are you asking, is it easier for them to learn something they like better or something that's easier to say? Okay. Um, I think it's easier for them to learn something they like better because they're more, there's more you know, incentive to learn it. And the book is really hard, but he learned to use esophageal speech to burp the, the book to say banana. Um, Alex likes carrots. Griffin hates carrots. So we cannot, you know, as you would expect, that we cannot get him to learn to say carrot. Um, but he learned orange because he learned it with respect to something else, where Alex learned orange because he asked us for the color of the carrot. So you, you know, he had to use something different to teach Griffin the color orange. So yeah, I mean, there, I, that's, definitely, that's definitely involved. And that's why, okay, in terms of foods, we rarely teach them labels for foods. They actually, almost all the food labels, they have picked up on their own in order to ask us for what they like. Again, Athena, who doesn't like to talk that much, but she has learned to say yam and corn because those are her favorite foods. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Um, I want to ask um, when parents answer your question, uh, they just repeat in your voice, parts of your voice, or they can use their, their own intonations? Okay, well, basically, for certain tasks, they have to repeat the labels that we give them. But for other tasks, they innovate. And this was particularly interesting. So we were giving Alex a task on number comprehension. And the task was there were a lot of different, there were several different sets of different colored blocks of different numbers. So there were like, there was, I think there were six blue blocks, four green blocks, and three yellow blocks. And the question was, what color is three? And he was very bored at this task at this point, and sometimes he would just throw all the blocks on the floor, wouldn't answer at all, or give us all the wrong colors. And so I asked him this time, what color three? And he looks at me and he goes, five. And there were no five blocks on the tray. So I say, Alex, what color three? And he says, five. And we go back and forth. And finally, I look at him and I say, Okay, you know, what color five? I don't understand what's going on. He looks at me and he goes, None. <laughs> so he figured out how to manipulate me to ask the question that he wanted to answer. And that's when he transferred his concept of absence from an absence of an attribute to an absence of a set of numbers. So these are the kinds of things that they will do using their vocalizations. I hope that answers the question. Добрый вечер. Спасибо большое. Вопрос дилетанта. Я вот в гостях. Я, понимаете, очень люблю фантастику. Вот сегодня я как раз закончил перечитывать Стругацких «Улитка на склоне». Мне напомнило, что вы примерно этим же занимаетесь. Давайте вот как пофантазировали, что ли. Возникли методики в результате ваших исследований, да? И через 15, там 20, 30 лет, допустим, э, то есть, ну, возникли методики какие-то, да? То есть ваши попугаи поднялись, мы опустились где-то до 7 лет. И сможем поговорить ну, об Амазонке, о красоте. Ну, вот чисто фантастика. Возможно. 
Леш, можно микрофон? Микрофон, да, можно. Giggle, and she'll point to the basket and say, "Ha ha!" She'll still think it's here. 
So they have, so the younger children have no theory of what the other person does or does not know, whereas the older child does. And when you try to do something like that with the birds, you end up with all sorts of different types of explanations about, you know, well, where was, you know, latency from last placement and things like that, that are not as clean. And Joseph Cole did something with looking, you know, where the animal was looking in a paper that was published. And there's another paper that's come out that's, you know, disagreeing with those results. So even something like the, you know, glancing thing, and with birds with the eyes on the opposite sides of their heads, that's really a problem as to, you know, what are they really looking at. So, I mean, this is something I'm fascinated by. I am really trying to come up with some kind of task that would absolutely work on this. But I haven't yet. And if anybody has some great ideas, you know, let me know. And, you know, we, we could try it out. Because, I mean, you, you need to know something like that. And my, my intuition is that they do. Because when you think about Athena putting that, you know, ring and thinking what we, you know, she thinks that we know that what she's knowing and things like that. I mean, that's that's suggestive, right? But we can't can't prove it. And the last question. Thank you very much for uh, a wonderful lecture. My question is: uh, Could you tell us something about the imagination in Paris? Could they imagine something what they haven't uh, seen or heard yet? Man, how would a parrot imagination? That's that's kind of like theory of mind. Um, but again, when you think about that task where Alex was, you know, asking, saying five, and he must. I mean, I'm, I'm I am not sure. But my intuition is that he was imagining what he could do to t make to manipulate me into asking the question he wanted to answer. And so, in a sense, that's that is some kind of imagination. I mean, that's my intuition. Um, in terms of you know something like the the visual manipulation thing, you certainly have to have. I mean, I don't know if you would call it imagination, but you have to have some visions in your mind of where those little things are moving around to keep tracking track of them. So you have to have representation of information, which is a little different from imagination. Okay, but I think it's related in some way. It's really it's hard. It's hard. I think this is the time to say thank you very much to Professor Ivan Sapper. Well, thank you. 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 That we double check the location. This is at Faculty of Psychology. Uh, Makarov and Bankman 6, not here, but two next open lectures the one by Professor Michael Corbalis on the 3rd, and the one by Professor Lashana Fariga on the 5th, are going to be held here according to the program. We expect you back. Thank you. Thank you.